So the word the Lord gave me for this week, he, sometimes he gives me one and sometimes he doesn't. So this, uh, this week the word, oh, that's okay, I'm okay with that, God's okay with that, um, is uh, how do we find our security? And so I don't know if you guys have ever heard me talk about Derek Prince. Um, every so often, I'll, um, I've got an app. It's called a Derek Prince app. You'll have to look him up sometime. Derek Prince has probably been dead for, I really don't know how long now, 10, 12, so many years. Very knowledgeable in the word. So look him up sometime, watch his videos. He's from England, London, somewhere like that. Anyway, he's got a cool accent, but... So sometimes I'll look up his stuff, I looked up his app, and um, I just really, when I saw this one, it says, how do we find our security? And I was like, woo, I know how we've tried to find our security, and it definitely didn't work after COVID. Um, so how do some of us find our security? We look for our security in our husbands, we look for our security in our friends, we look for security in our wives, our jobs, our house, our church, our possessions, our things, and our government. And the list goes on and on. Wow, what happens when some of those fail us? Where's our security? God reminded me when I was listening to this message, he just brought the ver uh, Job up to me in the first chapter of Job 21. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Have you felt like thanking the Lord when he's taken something away from you? Sometimes we actually go, Lord, why did you do that? I don't understand. What have I done, Lord, that I deserve that? Instead, the Lord is taking things out of our life right now that are not healthy. It can be painful, but our security has to be in the Lord. How do we get our security in the Lord? What, do we do? what can we do to get our security in the Lord? It's obviously getting the word. But sometimes we think we just come to church, we can get the word for Sunday, and we're good throughout the week. We're not living in those times anymore. We have to constantly now be in the word. That's not a religious thing. That is because our hope has to be in Jesus. We're constantly bombarded with lies from the enemy of where our security comes from. In Psalms 23... Chapter 1, he talks about everything we need should come from the Lord. Uh, verse 4 is, even though you guys know this verse, it's the one that's talking about, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, because who's with you? God. So when we're in these times, we have to know the word of the Lord. Why do we need to know the word of the Lord? It's not so we can quote it. And act all Jesus-y, it's so we can live this life and live in peace. Our minds can be at peace. When all this craziness is going on around us, we're not putting our trust in our friend that we just called and she can't answer her phone because she's going through a bad day. She can't answer it tomorrow or the next day. Who's your security in? It has to be in the Lord. So here's another verse. Uh, it's Job 28, 14. Um, well, Job 28, 14, you guys look that up. That talks about the secret places. What, where is a secret place? Resting in the Lord is a secret place that we can go to. How do we do that? Have you guys ever heard of Psalms 91? People have quoted Psalms 91. A lot of people talk about when they are on a battlefield, like literally in a battle, not in a mind battle with the enemy, on the battlefield in war zones, and people are dying around them, they will quote Psalms 91, and they watch people fall and die all around them, and God protects them. If you don't know Psalms 91, look it up. Read it over yourself. Read it over your family. Read it over your house. There's some other scriptures that talk about the anchor. Where does our anchor and our hope and our security come from? It comes from Jesus. We have this hope that in an anchor that comes from Jesus, Jesus is the anchor, and we're like a boat. The Lord showed me 
um, in his word, he said, you know, we're like a boat. We're floating around all the time. How, how do we get stable? How do we get secure? If you're in a boat, how do you get secure? You're, exactly. You put down your anchor. Who's our anchor? Jesus. So think about this week when you feel like you're being tossed to and fro. Maybe God's saying, get alone with me, get in my word, put your anchor in me. Not in the security and the things of this world that are going to fail you, but put it in me. So this week, I'm going to say a quick prayer, and I'm going to ask the Lord to help show us how to put our souls, our minds, and our thoughts, and our everything into his security. That's the only way we're going to get peace in these days and times. And so, Lord, I just lift everybody up in here to you, Lord. I ask that you help us, Lord. When we start making things in this world our security, Lord, that are just fleeting, they pass away. You say naked that we came into this world, naked that we leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so, Father God, I ask that in these days and times that our security will be so secure in you because we know your word, not so we can quote it and throw it in people's faces, Lord, so we can have your peace that passes all understanding, so we can have the hope of eternity, so we can give that hope to people that are in desperate situations that have no hope, that have no peace, Lord, but how do we get it is through getting a closer, more intimate relationship with you that nothing can break that security that belongs in you, Lord. I ask that you show each and every one of us, we're all, you've made us all um, children of you, but we're also individuals. So show each person every day of their walk with you how the security works between you and them because it works different. And so, Lord, show them how your word is powerful it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It does what it says it's going to do. It cannot come back null and void. And so, Lord, when we speak out your word, which is truth, it is our anchor. It is our security. And we thank you, Lord, that we have that hope. Lord, help us to give out that security and hope to others, Lord. Not be their codependent source, but show them that through your word and who you are, that is where we get our security. We love you and we thank you, Lord, that we do have that security in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to go ahead and read Psalms 91 over us. We know this is a powerful scripture because this is a scripture that Jesus tried to use to tempt, I'm sorry, Satan tried to use to tempt Jesus to do something really dumb, right? Psalms 91, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to just try to put yourself into this prayer with your imagination. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so that you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them 
my salvation. So, Father, I thank you for this promise that you give us. Thank you, Lord, for the promises you give us in Psalms 91 for your protection. And I pray that protection over every person that's here today, over every person that watches online. We, Father, we pray that protection of your angels over them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, how's everybody doing? You tired? You ready to go home? All right, so I get to talk? All right. I'm going to start out with some questions. You know, I like to do that sometimes. <laughs> Carter said, yeah. How many of you know somebody that's always ready and willing to give you advice? They know a lot of things about a lot of things. But you know they don't do the things they tell you to do. Anybody know that person? A few people know them. Okay. Maybe they got good advice, maybe it's good data because they've taken time to learn and they know facts. <laughs> maybe it's always good advice. We're going to let her preach here in a minute. Maybe it's always good advice, but you just notice that they've got good advice, they've got good facts, and they don't do anything with it. Okay? You with me? I'm going to hit a couple stereotypes, and I'm not trying to offend anybody. Maybe it's somebody that's overweight, out of shape. And they're always willing to give you advice on what you should eat and how you should exercise. Anybody know that person? <laughs> we came in contact with it yesterday, didn't we? <laughs> You're like, man, this is good stuff. They're telling me not to eat this and not to eat that and do this exercise. But I don't know if it really works because I don't see them applying it to their lives. Maybe... It's a single person, and they're giving you marital advice or relationship advice. Anybody ever had that? You're like, wait a second, you don't even have a relationship. How are you giving me advice? <laughs> Maybe it's somebody giving you parenting advice, and they ain't got any kids. Chris said that's his favorite. Anybody ever run into that? Well, this is what you need to do with your kids. Do you have kids? No, but this is what I'm going to do. You have no clue until you have kids how dang hard it is, Okay. Or maybe they got kids and they're giving you advice on how to discipline your kids while their kids are running around destroying everything in the store. You know those people? <laughs> kind of do as I say, not as I do. Maybe it's somebody that knows the Tennessee driver's manual inside and out, but they don't use their blinkers. <laughs> they left lane drive while they tell you not to left lane drive. Just waiting on all the husbands to nudge their wives right now. <laughs> Maybe, maybe it's worse. Maybe it's in our society, and maybe we have this example. <laughs> Just give you a moment to digest that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't know, Sean. <laughs> All right, that has to go in the name of Jesus. Okay, so maybe it's secular advice about weight, driving, what you eat, all that stuff. Or maybe it's biblical advice. Ooh. Maybe they can tell you all the benefits of forgiveness and all the scripture on forgiveness, and you're like, but you don't do it. You're constantly telling me who you can't forgive. You know, I had a guy tell me one time, he goes, I know, I know that scripture says that I, my sins will not be forgiven unless I forgive, but I cannot forgive this person, and I never will. I was like, oh, you said it, pal. <laughs> I ain't got to say anything. You just minister to yourself. Maybe they're willing to tell you how to fight fear, but you're seeing fear creep up in their life on a daily basis that drives them to isolation or control or anger or depression. Maybe they can recite 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, backwards and forwards about love, but you don't see them being kind and patient. You see them being irritable and rude, the things Paul says don't do. Maybe they tell you that testing brings joy, but you see them getting really down and complaining all the time and staying defeated. Maybe they tell you to trust God's timing, but you watch them never trust God's timing and get very upset because God's not doing what they want when they want. You guys know any of those people? So what do you think I'm going to talk about today? Anybody got a guess? Anybody got a guess? Do you think I'm going to talk about hypocrisy? 
You think I'm going to talk about do what I say, not as I do, as I say, not as I do? I'm really not. Okay? There's going to be a theme of hypocrisy that kind of intertwines throughout this topic. But if I were to sum up today's theme, if there's one phrase, I would say it's not enough to know what the Bible says. You have to do something. You have to do it. It's not enough to know it. Okay? James 1. James 1, 22, it says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. There's the sermon right there. Don't just listen to God's word. You have to to do what it says. See, there's lots of us that know God's word. There's lots of us that know what we're supposed to do. And then what do we not do? What God's word says, right? He says, otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and you don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, you forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that God, I'm sorry, the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. So what's James saying? You can't, don't just read the word. Don't just know the word. You've got to do something. Otherwise, you're fooling yourself. So what, what do you think he's talking about when he says you're fooling yourself? What, what do you think he means? Do you realize that there is a church, I'm talking the big C, you know, people say there's church with a little C, church with a big C, we would be a church with a little C, the church, all the people that are Christ followers would be the big church, the big C. Do you realize there's a church out there that is so weak and ineffective? It is so weak and it's so ineffective. Why? Why? Do you think it's possible that for many, many years people have been really concerned about what scripture says but not doing it? And it creates a thing where people are being fooled. They're fooling themselves. I know scripture, that's enough, right? I believe in Jesus, that's enough. And don't worry, I'm going to fight the religious side of this in a minute. If you're starting to build a little tension, oh no, here he goes, telling me i got to do more and i got to do good works. We're going to get to that in a minute because we're going to talk about balance there. But my point is there is, an, uh, there is an ineffective church out there today, and we're seeing it, guys. We saw it in the COVID world. We're seeing it in today's world with our environment. The fact that I put that picture up there, the fact that this week's arguments are more about Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head, <laughs> Peter Pan is a bad cartoon now and pulled by Disney, pulled for children, I should say, or I don't know if it's not recommended. I don't know if I'm saying the right words. They've pulled it and warned or whatever because it's racial. And Dr. Seuss is bad. I never really liked Dr. Seuss anyway, but the point is we got a society arguing right now about a toy and about a book series for children and about a movie that's been a staple movie for people to watch for years and years and years. Where's the church? Are we fooling ourselves because we know the word, but we don't do anything? I mean, I think there's a lot of people out there. We're playing church. We can tell you all the good things that we've done in the past. I mean, salvations, how we're being game changers for the kingdom. But in reality, we're fooling ourselves if we're not careful. We have to do what it says. We have to do what the word says to do. I think that, and we've talked about this, as churches, we fall into this trap. We're in this building right now. We're in this safe environment. It's very safe for us, right? It's very safe. We have the comfort of our own people. If I screw up, hopefully you guys will come back next week. It's no big deal. You forgive me. I don't have to worry about messing up. I don't have to worry about being perfect. And we fall into this trap because our goal is, man, if I can just get someone to come to church with me, the pastor will fix them. The youth pastor will fix them. Jason's wife will fix them. And that's the trap we fall into. My job is to get filled up in my little safe haven, and then I'm going to go out and I'm going to say, hey, you should come to my church. And they're looking at you like, no, I'm tired of going to church. I'm tired of being around people that say one thing and don't do any of it. I'm sick of it. That is the world we live in, guys. And I think that's maybe, maybe, maybe what James meant when he said we're fooling ourselves. A lot of you get this, but I'm going to challenge each of us. We've got to lose the mindset of what church is, and we've got to take on a new mindset. This church is a place you come to get trained up so you can do what? Go out. You get trained up 
You get poured into here so you can go out Monday or Sunday afternoon through Saturday. You're going to pour out into other people. This is a place you come, you lay down all your garbage of the week, you get prayed over, you fight off things, but you are trained, filled back up with worship, prayer, teaching, whatever, so you go out. And don't get me wrong, I mean, everything that happens inside this building is very important. There's fruit from it. I'm not saying there's not. I'm saying we've got to have the correct mindset, or I think we're falling into that. We're just fooling ourselves mentality. At the end of every sermon, what do I do? Challenge. I challenge you. Man, that came out really quick over here. <laughs> At the end of every service, I try to challenge you. Don't just listen to what I'm saying. Take what I'm saying and do something with it this week. Now, I'll leave that up to you. I don't typically call you on Tuesday, hey, have you done that yet? I'm not, like, trying to oversee everything you do. My goal is that we teach you something, we talk about things that are real that we're going through, and then we challenge you to go do it. So a few weeks ago, somebody came up to me, and he jabbed me. And he said something to the tune of, I knew you'd probably call me out on this. Because I didn't do what you said, so I'll just go ahead and tell you. My first thought was, hallelujah, you know me. Because <laughs> I expect you to do something. Everything we talk about, what we talk about today, I expect you to do something. But number two, I've always been open and honest about you about where I fail in trying to do those things or where I fall down in not doing those things too. There are times I'm a listener and a learner and not a doer, and you guys challenge me. So I don't ask you to do anything that I'm not doing already. So what I wanted to be a smart aleck and say to the guy was, hey, thanks for that compliment. That's awesome. It really made you mad that I challenged you. But my point is I'm expecting you when I get up here and do this to take and listen and learn and then go do something with it. We talked about little things for two weeks. God loves little things. Got to do the little things before you get the big things. We're all looking for the big things, but Satan loves little things too, right? So I want to be clear, when I'm asking you to do things, I'm trying my best not to ask you to go do huge things. I'm asking you to do little things that build into big things. I'm not asking you to quit your career and move to a third world country and start an orphanage, right? That would be tough. I'm not asking you to quit your career and become a preacher because everybody thinks that's what we should do. I fell into that trap, and I thank God I did, but that was the thought, is i got to quit my career and go into ministry if I'm going to have any effect on Christians at all. I'm not asking you to do that. Those are big things. They're great things, but I'm asking you to do little things. They may seem big to you if you've never done them before. So what's little to me may be big to you. I get that, but I'm not asking you to do these huge things, okay? So I mentioned earlier, I want to take a minute, and I want to make sure and be careful that we're not getting into a religious mindset about doing good works to get to heaven. We should do good things. Why? Anybody know? Why? Because he's died for us, because we love him. We should want to do good things because we love him and we want to follow him, not because we're trying to earn his love. And many of us are taught that mentality, let's be honest. A lot of us grew up in that mentality in our denominations or whatever, and there's a big difference. Am I going to do good things for Jesus because I want to earn his love and earn his salvation? Or am I going to do good things because I love him so much for what he did for me? And I'm begging you to fall into that second area, okay? I'm sorry if you've ever been taught by a human that you had to do something to earn a human's love or to earn God's love. That is not the way Scripture lays it out, and I'm sorry if you were taught that. I'm asking you, if you grew up in that, change your mind. And it's tough. A lot of us grew up in that. And as much as I stand up here and say it, i got to walk out the door tomorrow and do it. Because guess who gets caught up in thinking i got to do too much to earn God's grace? Okay? So if I feel like if I'm challenged with it, there's probably other people who are challenged with it as well. If you're not, praise the Lord. But if you are, change your mind. I want you to do good things for other humans and do good things for Jesus because you love him. Okay? Jesus, you died for me on the cross. You saved me from that nasty man I was. You saved my family. I want to do good because I love you because you saved me. 
not because I did all these bad things and I'm trying to prove to him that I'm worthy or I'm good. Does that make sense? Okay, Ephesians 2, verse 8, Paul says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit from this for this because it's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. But wait a second, didn't he say in Romans that all I had to do was believe? Right? But he's starting to introduce this concept of good works here. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you've done, so none of us can boast about it. For if we for we are God's masterpiece, he's created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do good things. So Paul's pretty clear. You were saved by his grace when you believed. But it was a gift. And it's not a reward for the good things, but you were made for good things. God created each of you to do good things. The problem we have is even as Christians, we're conditioned by our society to look at extremes, right? We either go to one side and do nothing Man, I'm saved by the grace of Jesus. I made that decision. I'm going to heaven. I ain't got to do nothing. Or, I'm going to work so daggum hard to get to heaven that I'm going to get so burned out that I'm totally ineffective. Anybody understand either of those extremes? Anybody figured out the middle yet? Okay, good. Just making sure we're talking to the right crowd. I'm asking you to do something, but I don't want you to do it to earn God's love or to outshine another Christian. I don't want you to think you've got to do so much that you end up getting burned out and become ineffective for Jesus. And I think that's our struggle. We kind of fall, as I was praying through this, I was thinking we kind of fall into one of three camps. I hope there's a fourth one, but I think it's really just one of three. One is I'm saved by the grace of Jesus, and we sit back and we do nothing. I already said that. Two... I'm saved by the blood of Jesus because of all the good things I've done. Or three, I'm saved, therefore I'm supposed to do good works, and I'm going to do them 24-7 every day until I'm so burned out I can't do anything else, and I'm depressed, and everything's heavy, and I feel like a failure, and I'm sick. I'm hoping there's a fourth camp where we get our arms around that we are supposed to learn, we're supposed to do, but we create a balance. Okay, and if I had a magic formula for that balance, I promise I would stand up here and tell you, but it is a daily fight to try to figure it out. By the way, did I leave anybody out when I mentioned those three camps? We're saved, we do nothing. We're saved because we got to work our way to Jesus. Or we're saved, that's good, I'm going to do good works, and I'll run myself into the ground. So here's your challenge. Here's your first challenge of the day. If you're in camp one, do something. Just something. I don't really care what it is. Just do something. Encourage someone. Pray over someone. Serve someone. Tell someone Jesus loves them. I don't really care. I'm just asking you, if you're in the camp of I'm saved and I'm doing nothing, take the first step and do something. Do something small. It doesn't have to be huge. If you're in camp two, I'm asking you to change your mindset because it is wrong. I know we were taught it for generations that we had to work our way to God and to his favor, but that is not what Paul says here. He says your salvation was a gift. You are made for good work. So if you're in that second camp, I'm challenging you to change your mind. If you're in camp three, keep doing good stuff. I'm not asking you to like back off and do nothing. I'm not asking you to go from I'm doing stuff all the time to nothing. There still has to be that balance, right? But I'm asking you to tone it back a little bit so you don't get burned out. Wendy has a famous saying, we think if we're doing good works, we got to go big or go home. That's the extremes. we got to do it big or not do it at all. And we have to, as Christians, find the balance between those. And and like I said, it's going to be a lifetime struggle. Here's my problem. My problem is I'm so thankful for what Jesus did. I want to do good. And I start doing good, and I start doing more, and I start doing more, and without even realizing, I fall into the camp of wearing myself out. And honestly, that's my concern for most of you in here. We need you. 
We need you as volunteers. We need you to go out and do ministry. But I need you healthy and on fire, not burned out. Does that make sense? We have to make sure we're not doing so much that we lose our passion. I'm trying to get everybody on the same page because we've got to understand what the Bible says about doing good things. But if we're not on the same page, we're not going to be effective. We each have to share the workload. The mentality of church is the pastor, the staff, the main volunteers. Anybody ever heard there's a statistic in church that 20% of the people do 80% of the work? Okay, I want to I thank you guys because our church is different, so thank you very much. It's more flipped the other way. Wait, 20% of the people, 20% of the people, I can't get that right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm totally confused. So in typical churches, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. That is not true here, and I want to thank you guys for that. There is much more of an equal workload being shared. But we got to get on the same page because if too many people are carrying too much of a workload, we're going to get burned out, and that's going to lead to the mindset of I, I, I'm not good enough. You're going to start hearing lies. You're not going to have a passion for going and doing it, and we become a less effective church. But some of us are just flat lazy, and we got to get out of that mindset too. Whether it's serving, preaching, praying, tithing, I can go on and on. We've got to get on the same page and share this workload if we're going to win a very dark world over. A dark world that's really upset because we label a potato head a toy, Mr. or Mrs. That is the world we live in right now. That is not an extreme. The company that makes the toy is so confused that first they said, yep, we're going gender neutral on this toy. It's not going to be a Mr. and Mrs. anymore. And then they caught so much crap from people that went, are you nuts? That they went, wait a second, we're going to stay. They don't know what to do. We live in a world that's so confused right now. And we have to be on the same page about what our job is if we're going to win the world over for Jesus. James says, do good works. Don't just learn, don't just read, do. Paul says you were made to do good works. But what did Jesus say? Matthew 5, 16. He says, in the same way, let your good deeds shine for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So the man that died for you, the man that we're here for, he didn't just say, here's a suggestion. He said, here's a command. I am telling you, let your good deeds shine because I'm the light, Jesus. I'm the light, not me, Jesus. Jesus is saying, I'm the light. And the way I'm going to be shined to the world is through your good deeds. But wait, what have we been taught in church? Uh, don't tell other people what you do because the right hand shouldn't know what the left hand's doing, right? And that's scripture. Yeah, that's later on in Matthew 6 when he's talking about giving to the needy. And he's talking specifically about the Pharisees who are going out and giving to the needy and bragging about it. And he's saying, you're doing it with the wrong heart, guys. Don't go out there and give to the needy and tell everybody what you've done and how much you've done with the wrong heart. But previous to that, he's saying we have to let our good deeds shine. So here's my concern. My concern is some of us haven't grown up in church. We don't know we're supposed to do good deeds. We don't know where they fit in. And then some of us that grow up in church think that we're a bad Christian if we let our light shine. But Jesus tells us we've got to let our light shine. we just got to do it with the right heart, with the right motivation. Don't be boastful and bragging. That brings attention to who? Me. Not God. Jesus said, let your good deeds shine for all to see. And why? 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 So your heavenly Father will be praised. You know, we don't tell you. We're not, we're not here bragging every time we take your tithing money and go give it to someone who's needy or pay somebody's electric bill so their electricity doesn't get cut off or pay somebody's medical bill, or buy them groceries. We're not up here bragging about it. But we need to shine in that dark world. We need to go do good deeds. we got to be open about it so God is praised. 
So I know this is confusing. So if this confuses you, please come talk. Let's have a dialogue. Have it in here. If you've got questions, stop me. Let's talk about it. Because there's always going to be this balance, this tightrope we're trying to walk. I'm supposed to do good, and I'm supposed to do it for the right reasons. So God will be glorified. I'm supposed to let my good things shine, right? I'm supposed to let my good deeds shine so God is praised. So Satan's going to tempt you to be way over here at this extreme or way over here at this extreme, and we got to figure out where this middle ground is. So if you don't know, should I tell people what I did? Come talk. Let's talk about it. Let's figure this out together. We may not get it right, and that's okay. We have to learn from each other's perspectives. Wendy and I are, and I are not like experts on what to do on this stuff. We have to gain from each other. That's the beauty of this thing we're doing together. This is huge for us to get, and I'm going to tell you why. Next week, you're going to see what the next generation's up to. Most of you already know, but you're going to see what God's doing in the next generation. When they lead our entire service from beginning to end, you're going to see what God's up to in the next generation. The week after that, we're going to take that Sunday off so we can rest. Okay? <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're going to get out of this religious churchy mindset. You know we've done it before. My goal is to do it at least four times a year. But we get sucked in. It's like, oh, crap, we haven't done it since December. We're going to take that week off. Okay? So March 21st, we're going to take off. Then when we come back on March 28th, we're going to continue this because we're going in a direction on what is our church going to be in 2021. See, we thought we were going to do this in 2020, and this nasty thing called COVID hit, and then it was kind of like survival and what do we do? Should we stay open? How do we help people fight fear? What do we do? But I want to get back on track. We're going to start talking about what we're going to do as a church. We're two years in. What is our identity? What are we going to do outside of these four walls? Carter wears a shirt every once in a while. What's your shirt say? The church has left the building. I had to answer for him because he wears lots of shirts. <laughs> and I'm tired of hearing it, and I'm ready to do something, okay? And I want every one of you to be on board for a reason because we need you. But I need you to do it with the right heart. And I need you to do it in a way that we don't get burned out by doing it. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know exactly what we're going to do yet. But that's okay. Some of y'all are like, that's not okay. i got to know exactly what we're doing, what day we're doing it, what time we're starting and ending. And some of you are like, hallelujah, let's go wing it. <laughs> Jacob's not afraid. He's going with us. But when we come back after... Next week and the week after being off, we're going to focus on what we're going to do as a church to let a light shine in a broken world with one goal, to praise God. So I'm going to give you a couple more scriptures that enforce the message I'm trying to get across today, but then I'm going to end with some examples. There are a lot of little things happening around us in our little church, and I want to make sure that we are letting those things shine. Because I do think we all get caught up in this, well, let's not brag about what we're doing. Okay, well, you don't brag about it. I'm going to stand up here today, and I'm going to tell everybody what you're doing, and we're going to give God praise. Okay? But I'm going to hit a few scriptures first. Hebrews 10, 24, it says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us think, not let Jason and Wendy think, okay? We need your help. If God puts something on your heart that we can do to go be in our community, I'm just going to go ahead and give you a heads up. I want to be different than what other churches are doing. I'm tired. I'm tired of the let's go hand out stuff and look good because we put our name behind it. I don't want to do it unless we're building relationships, unless we're investing in those people, unless we're going to get repeat opportunities to go back to those people. And not everybody's going to accept that. I get that. But we need your help in thinking. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. So give us your ideas over these next couple of weeks, okay? If you don't like the areas that we're going into, give us that feedback. Hebrews 13, 16, and it says, Don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Here's the biggest scripture I'm going to kind of land on today. 
James 2. So James 1 is what we started on. James 1, he said, don't just read, do. But he goes a little deeper in James 2. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? What good is it if you say you have faith in Jesus Christ and you don't do something? Again, didn't Paul say all you got to do is believe and have faith that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and you'll be saved? Yes, that's exactly what he said. But maybe we don't understand what he meant when he said all you have to do is have faith. Okay, and James is coming along behind it to say this is what, why you need faith. This is what you do with your faith. He says if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions, what good is it? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has need who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you you don't give that person any food or clothing, what good does it do? So you see, faith by itself is not enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. I didn't say it. Don't get mad at me. James said it. If you say you have faith and you do nothing, guys, it's useless. And I'm sorry if that hurts a little bit. Now do you understand why I wanted to make sure that you didn't think you were created by good works, but you are created for good works? Because you could take this verse right here and say, man, if I have faith and I'm not doing anything, it's useless. And Satan will want you to take it all the way to the other extreme and work your butt off to the point that you're totally ineffective. So I'm saying it again. We have to find the middle ground. And you got to help me find it. you got to keep me accountable. <laughs> Wendy does all the time. you got to keep me accountable if I'm going to one side or the other. And I'm going to keep you accountable too. Okay, so I'm giving you that permission. I'm asking you to join this fight with us. I don't want my faith to be useless, and I don't want your faith to be useless. He goes on. It gets more harsh. I'm just going to be honest with you. He says, now someone may argue, some people have faith, other people have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. So James says, there's not two camps here. There's not, you got faith and that's awesome and you're a servant and you're doing good stuff over here. He's saying, you can't show me faith without good deeds. I show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith, for you believe there is one God, good for you. Even the demons believe that. So you got these people, I got faith. I got faith, that's all I need. Yeah, good for you. James said, good for you. You're right up there with the demons. They believe in God. They tremble in terror. It's pretty foolish. I'm paraphrasing. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? And he goes on to talk about Abraham. Abraham's the father of faith. What did God do? God tested him. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes. Are you serious, God? I waited 100 years for this boy, and you want me to kill him? Yeah. He was tested. His faith was tested. Would he do what God told him to do? Because if he's going to be the father of faith, he's got to be willing to do. Now, God saved that moment, right? He redeemed that moment, and there was no killing. And then James goes on and talks about a prostitute. So you want to tell me you've done too many things in your past that make you a bad person? Well, James, when he's talking about faith and good works, uses a prostitute. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them away safely. What did she do? She did something. All she did was keep those people safe. Okay, so we have to think about ways to do good deeds. We have to know it pleases God, and we have to know that our faith will be shown by our good deeds, but don't let Satan take it to the extreme. If he loses us because we're willing to do good deeds, he's just going to try to take you to the extreme. We've said this before. There's a big old church out there. It's full of believers that are there for what they get. So if you're here today because you get salvation, because you get healing, because you get this promised prosperity, I'm challenging you to look inward. 
This isn't about what you get. It's not about what I get. It's about what we do with what we know. What if I mess up? Is it okay? What if, I'm scared to do it because what if I mess up? Can I ask you a question? How many people in here know how to ride a bike? Raise your hand if you know how to ride a bike. John, you never rode a bike? <laughs> how many of you got on that bike the first time without training wheels and just went? We have one. She has an extraordinary balance. <laughs> but what did most of us do? We fell. How many times did you fall? Bunch. But then what happened? One time, everything clicked. You fell, you fell, you fell, you fell, boom. You got it, and you probably never fell again unless you did something stupid, right? That's all I'm asking you to do. If you fail, get back up. It's okay. I'm going to tell you a quick story. I left my career eight years and two months ago. I did what every good Christian should do, right? I've never been on a mission trip. I don't know what to do. Let's go on a mission trip. So I jump on a plane to Haiti. My pastor says, you're going to share the gospel with this lady right here. And I went, <coughs> I mean, I went on a mission trip, but I thought I was here just to get an experience. I didn't know I was going to have to do something, right? That's what I'm thinking. So I want you to paint this picture, and it's going to be a little graphic. I'm sorry up front. You ever been to Haiti? Haiti doesn't really have trees because they, they, they burn wood to worship Satan, and they got no trees left. They're not very smart, okay? So, so everything's dirt. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. The people worshiping Satan aren't smart. So they got dirt floors, these huts made out of thatch or whatever. I'm just trying to paint this picture. And we walk up to this, and there is a lady cooking in this big, huge wok thing. I don't know what it is, a big, huge circle thing. And she's cooking, and she's selling food. And, my, and our pastor's like, witness to her. She's working. She's trying to make a living. And I'm like, uh... Okay, there was Adam and Eve. Uh, uh, God gave them a choice. They, they messed up. Uh, Satan, you know who Satan is because you guys worship him. He, he tempted her. And, and I'm doing all this through a translator, so I don't know if the translator is getting all the uhs. And uh, he sent Jesus to die for you because he loves you. I mean, I was stumbling through this, but, but in the meantime, she's not even looking at me. She's like serving food to people. And this guy walks up with a bottle of liquor. I don't know what it was, but you could smell it. And he's listening, so I turn and start talking to him. So now I got this guy that's half drunk with some kind of homemade Haiti moonshine drinking, and I'm witnessing to him, but he missed all the part about Adam and Eve, so I don't know if I need to start over or keep going. And then I look back, and the woman is breastfeeding. And I'm mortified. She's still serving food. And then there's a dump truck going beep beep backing up and I'm like why is there a dump truck out here it's dirt and thatch there's nothing to dump I failed I didn't do a good job I had to fail though I had to start somewhere I couldn't get up here today if I didn't have that failure what's my point please don't be scared to fail this is the safest place you can fail I'm the safest person you can fail around because I'm just going to pick you back up and help you and probably give you a stupider story of something I've done. I wish, get back on the bike. I wish I could go back to that lady and just look her in the eyes and hold her hands and say, there is a God that loves you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you. And I wish I could show her the passion of a God that loves her, but I can't go back and do that. It was a learning experience. Maybe there's a guy sitting around with some moonshine right now going, I don't know, this white guy came and it was terrible. I don't know. <laughs> God never asked you to be perfect. But I don't want you to look at me and say, man, he's just able to stand up here and preach and say all this stuff. Yeah, there was a day when I didn't even know how to explain who Jesus was. I had left my career to pursue ministry, and I couldn't even explain who Jesus was to someone in a third world country. God's not asking you to be perfect. He's asking you to do something. So I know I'm going a little long this morning, but she's going to come help me finish up, land the plane. I want to end this morning with some examples because I don't want you to feel beat up. I don't want you to feel like I'm saying you're not doing enough. Okay? That's the way it kind of sounds and started. I want you to understand the importance of doing something and being balanced. 
I want you to understand the importance of having a right heart, but I want you to know some examples of little things that are happening right around you. They're not going to brag on themselves. I'm going to brag on them to praise God. Brooks. Brooks led communion in her small group at youth. That is huge. I couldn't even witness to a Haitian cooking food with a baby. She's leading communion in her small group at a very young age. Daniel. Daniel in here? He might be out there helping the kids. We have watched Daniel become bold. He's worshiping more vocally. He's getting up here and reading scriptures, and he couldn't do that before, right? Because he was so scared. But we're watching him grow. He did your lyrics this morning. These are little things, but they're doing something. Faith. I heard that Miss Faith sang in public. Is that right, Faith? She did something. She has a talent. She has a voice. She did something. I've also watched her fight spiritual warfare. We hear that her voice is beautiful. Satan's telling her it's not. And I've watched her have to fight spiritual warfare to say you're wrong, Satan. See, she's shutting him down and fighting it so she can use her gift. That's doing something. Okay? Parker. When God gives Parker a word, you know what he does. He comes up here and he gives it. And it usually rocks you. <laughs> Parker, I think, is going to preach next week, right? Ten years old. He's constantly encouraging people, praying over people in public. He's doing something. Mungus. Mungus is Alan, little Alan. It's Lisa's son. He's not here today. My understanding is he was really bold in the last week or so to correct a friend who made a mistake. He's been bringing his friend Ryan to church, and I'm watching Ryan worship Jesus. And my understanding is he's never been in an environment to do that before. Peyton. Peyton leads our worship for our church, for our youth, for our college ministry. He's doing something. God gave him a talent, and he's doing something. He was bold to go to a, just one example, to go to, with the college students to the parking lot of the EMS place. I mentioned this before, and lead worship to bless those people that we depend on to keep us safe. Kaylin and McCall, I witnessed them jump up after a challenge to pray over their waitress. Parker may have jumped in front of them and done the prayer. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two wins there they were all red they were fighting over who could pray over their waitress that is doing something i've also witnessed them pray over a waitress when someone didn't jump in front of them i'm not getting on you did great okay just to be clear <laughs> jacob who stepped out of their comfort zone last week and came up here and led communion He said, man, it got really hot feeling when I went up there. Yeah, it does for me every Sunday, pal. <laughs> He's also a huge servant. See, you haven't seen him out there loading food boxes out of a truck. He is a huge servant. I believe he would do anything I ask him to do to serve people. He's willing to do something. I hope I get everybody here. Wiki, Peyton, Parker, Mungus, McCall, Lisa, uh, Justin, and Robin. Give up their Saturday to go serve at a few food distribution. And our goal is that we're going to show up at the beginning and stay to the end. A lot of churches don't do that. A lot of churches get their food and leave. Ryan and Mandy, I'm going to brag on them in a minute. Sorry. They're doing something. They're serving other churches who don't really appreciate it, just to be bluntly honest with you. I'll keep those stories for later when it's not being recorded. Anyway. They're doing something. They're serving, helping churches get their food, and then when we get our food, they're taking it out and distributing it in the community. Jordan Maiden, Jordan's not here today, but he's 16 years old. He's got his first job, and he's tithing. 16 years old, and he's learning the value of giving back to God what God's given him, and he's learned that from his parents. Paisley, Paisley's not in here right now. But Paisley, we talked about it last week. She gave her life to Jesus two Sundays ago. Within seven days, she prayed over her teacher. How old is Paisley? Seven? 
seven years old. She's doing something. So if you ain't doing something, you need to be challenged by a seven-year-old girl that said, I give my life to Jesus, and I get it. I got faith. I may not even know what it means yet, but I know I'm supposed to do something. This is Paisley's sister. <laughs> About to turn seven. Ryan and Mandy. Ryan and Mandy do more for this church than any two people could possibly, than you can imagine that two people can do. They invest in our youth. Mandy, God laid on Mandy's heart some years ago to start a, a, a college ministry. So when we talk about the college ministry, it's what God put on her heart. It's called Second Story because it happens in the second story of your home, right? I'm sure there's other reasons it's called that. But they've been obedient and they've done something. So I'm going to tell you about a few things that stem from that. Kaylin put a Bible verse and encouraging message on a car at Maryville College to brighten someone's day, right? Emily prayed over the president's assistant at Maryville College. Do you know that Jesus is being kicked out of colleges? But Emily went and prayed over the president's assistant. Carter. Carter prayed over a police officer in the community. And you guys heard him boldly give his testimony when he got baptized a couple weeks ago. Peyton. Peyton wrote an encouraging note on a receipt to his waitress. He went with us. He was with Carter and uh, Eli. And he's constantly challenging us to pray over people in public. Eli. Eli owns our media now. Eli is scheduling people every week to be on the computer to run lyrics and run. And he's, and he's investing in the people like Daniel and Parker to do that, to give them a job, to teach them how to do it. Eli, this is my favorite one of the whole bunch, I think. Eli prayed over his professor at Pellissippi State a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Old shy Eli prayed over his professor at Pellissippi State. Wiki prayed over someone at a gas station this week who was just a stranger, right? Just a lady that's a stranger. Some other small things. I promise I'm getting close to the end. Thursday night, 14 people gathered in this room to praise Jesus and to pray against the Equality Act. The Equality Act, which should be called the Perversion Witchcraft, and I'm going to confuse the heck out of your children act, but it's got a bad name. Don't let names fool you. 14 people gathered in this room to pray against that. Did that have any power? I don't know because Jesus only had 12 plus him. That's 13. We had 14. Jesus said we can do the same things he did. So I'm going to say yes, it had power. <laughs> Miss Karen. Miss Karen's not in here right now. She crammed 30, 33-pound food boxes into a Mazda CX something or other. I still don't know how we did it. Well, I'm counting the milk. 30, 33-pound food boxes to go distribute to him pretty much by herself into the community. I think a friend went with her. I could go on and on, but here's the cool thing. Those are just things that have happened in the last two weeks or three weeks. I'm not sure on time. But my, what is my point? My point is I want to leave you with encouragement. I want to brag about what these people are doing because I want to give God praise. So right now, I want to give God praise. Thank you, Father. Let's give him a hand clap. Little B Church in Friendsville. We decided last year not to stay home and hide. We decided, decided not to be complacent in the kingdom of God's being glorified in our community from this little bitty church. Yes, sir. Jeff and Casey. Jeff and Casey. <laughs> so I need to preface this by saying if I leave you out, it's not intentionally. Jeff's on our camera every week. Casey's doing our children's every week. <laughs> My point is, we're a little old church. We ain't got a sign. We ain't got a website. We ain't got a million-dollar budget. We ain't got none of the things that church is supposed to have to be successful. But God is doing something huge with something little. So I want to thank God. And my challenge to you this week is if you're not doing something, do something. Get on board with us to do something. If you're serving God to earn his love, change your mind and serve him because you love him. If you're serving God with the right heart and motivation, keep doing it. Just don't do too much and get burned out, okay? Father, thank you for every person you brought into this church. Father, thank you for the faithful servants you've given us that get the value of doing something. But today, Father, I hope they understand why it's so important. So, Father, bless them today. 
Bless them. Bless those that we just named and all the other ones. There's tons of other things we didn't say, and I don't want anybody to get their feelings hurt. Bless them for the little things they're doing that are big for you, God. And help us not to take for granted or underestimate the little things that we're doing in our community that you're going to do big things with. Father, help us motivate each other to do good works. Help us motivate each other to get off our lazy, complacent rear ends and do something. Help us that when we see someone overdoing it for the wrong reasons, that we just walk with them. And help them not to get too involved where they're doing it for the wrong reason to earn your love, or that we're doing it in such a way we would get burned out. Father, help us to understand this whole thing is a marathon, not a sprint. We get on fire, and we sprint, and then we can't make it through the rest. We burn out. So, Father, give us strength to continue running the race, to not give up. And, Father, show us who we're supposed to be as a church. Show us what we're supposed to be in the community. Show us what we're supposed to do. And, Father, you be glorified in everything. In Jesus' name, amen.